Okay, moving into the energy efficiency provisions, and I will talk firstly about the national provisions and try and bring in some of the, the New South Wales stuff into this as I go. But um, there's been some changes, and I know Vanessa might talk about some how this might differ slightly in the ACT, so that might follow well after this as well. But the code has now in incorporated that in addition to getting your, your six star standard rating, you will also need to meet separate heating and cooling load limit caps. So usually at the moment under your, your NATHERS certificate, and I don't know if you use BIRS Pro a lot here, it's the main one in, in, in ACT, um, but if you get your NATHERS certificate, which will say your megajoules output, but it doesn't give you a split level of what your heating, cooling, heating load limit and what your cooling load limit needs to be. What we're starting to see is some buildings that might perform really well in winter, but feel a bit poorly in summer, or vice versa. So by putting these, these caps in there, that helps to try and result in more climate responsive designs. I can't believe I just said climate responsive design. I sound a bit like that planner again, didn't I? Um, but yeah, so they've incorporated that stuff into the code to have those split heating cooling load limit caps. That's something that's already been embedded into BASICs in New South Wales for a number of years already. Um, and so the code moved, moved to a similar approach there. There's also been some changes or to the thing called the reference building verification method. And also about the inclusion of the blower door test method into the code as an optional verification method where you could still meet your building ceiling provisions of part 3.12.3. I'll go through a little bit more detail of these ones rather than just those governing covering slides. So firstly, the changes to the reference building verification method. And don't worry, this isn't the method itself. This is the out of the ABCB's advisory note that they're, oh, sorry, um, handbook that they're developing around the supporting material. Um, so this method allows for people to essentially have some elements of trading between building elements. And the way that I generally try and describe it as a simple way to describe it is just say you wanted to put a stained glass or period feature window in the front of your house. It wouldn't meet the current glazing calculator requirements, you know, or meet your, you wouldn't be able to get your star rating based on it. So instead what you do is you put that window in there and then you compensate for it with putting better insulation, higher performing insulation in your wall and in your ceiling to, say, to at the end of the day result in giving you an overall energy performance that would have been equal to what would have been a deemed to satisfy design anyway. That's essentially what it does allow for you to do. In saying that, there's been some use of the ref reference building verification method that's been getting some results that were, you know, resulting in some designs that were much lower than what the, a six star standard might be. So the Building Codes Board have made some changes there to tighten up its application, make some more prescriptive inputs to it to essentially result in it being um, hopefully in any energy efficiency option you use for determ determining compliance that you get somewhat of an equal sort of outcome in terms of the energy performance of the building overall. Part of that has been, another change to that reference building method has been to clarify what type of software tools you're allowed to, modelling tools you're allowed to use as part of using that method. And to clarify that the NATHERS tools, your BIRS Pro, your Accurate, your First Rate 5, aren't to be used as part of this method. Therefore, a specific, therefore the NATHERS, um, as part of your six star standard requirements, if you wanted to use a tool, it would have to be a tool, not one of those tools. And there are other tools available in the market. Um, that could be used as part of that analysis. And that's what that change there has been in terms of the definition changes in the code. Another change has been the incorporation of the blower door test method into the code. Has anyone used the blower door test method or aware of the blower door test method for any of your projects? Um, so this method has been incorporated into the code um, to that is a verification method, so it's optional, it's not mandatory to use it. And it's there to, you can still your, use your building ceiling provisions of part 3.12.3. Some There's been some changes there, but this is a method that you could use to verify your air leakage rates in your building, your building ceiling requirements. 
it does give a fairly good um, indication of where your linkage paths might be in your building. It's probably not going to be one that's going to be used blanketly across the industry, but it might be something that you, some of you may want to consider as part of your, you know, offering a niche product and things like that as part of a, you know, marketing of your of your pro, of your systems that you know you've undertaken this blower door test method. What the blower door test method does essentially it seals up your doors and windows and puts this 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 rig there. It pumps air in the building and it can give you an indication of where the leakage path will be. It puts it up to an air, you know, pumps it up into the certain amount of air and then you, it gives you a threshold level of where your air change rate should be. And what the code is saying that it should be um, not more than um, 10 metres, I, I hate the metric, I never really understand it, but it's 10, 10 um, air change rates per hour is essentially how I've got it described to me, but I think it's a bit more complicated than that. Um, and then there is a method in how you do that. There are a number of um, different bodies that can do these types of testing. Um, and if you, you know, punch them into the internet, you'll see some different association and others that do that. As I said, it's not mandatory. It's just a, a voluntary compliance option. And this is another one of those ones that HIA had some concern on this one by putting it into the code. A lot of people might have been using it at the moment, but using it as a quality assurance tool rather than using it as a compliance tool. The last thing we want to see is you finish your building and then people are then requesting you do a blower door test method to see if it meets the air change rates as part of the energy performance. That's not its purpose for incorporation in the code. It's there as a compliance option. As I said, you still get your deemed to satisfy building ceiling provisions you can use, but and that's what that very explanatory information has been incorporated there to clarify that it's there as an option that you can use, not as a quality assurance type of mechanism. I mentioned as well that we already have building ceiling provisions in the code. Um, these apply to, on top of, your getting your six star standard or your Nathurst star rating, or using the prescriptive elemental deemed to satisfy provisions, or under BASICS as well in New South Wales, that these provisions apply on in addition to getting your, your rating, for lack of a better term, these provisions still need to be achieved and use your building ceiling provisions. A lot of what you do currently, you know, it talks about using tight fitting, you know, between your junctions. It talks about using, you know, your, your ceiling to have, you know, tight fitting, square set, cornices about next to windows and joins, about seals to doors and things like that. So a lot of the stuff you're already doing are, is, is it part of this section. This section has been in the code for a number of years. We probably highlight it because I'm not sure how well everyone is aware that these provisions do apply on top of your energy assessment. So they have had some changes there because some of it was a bit qualitative and a bit more prescriptive in there. So again, one of those areas I'd recommend having a look at back in your office if you're not fully aware of these provisions about um, needing to follow this stuff. So in terms of the, the provisions, the changes in particular around the heating and cooling load limit caps being done on addition to your energy assessment um, have you know, a lot of that stuff hasn't been embedded into some of the software yet. And the last thing we wanted to have happen was that you were then have to have an assessment for your star rating and then have to have a separate assessment to see where you were then get your heating and cooling load limit caps. So part of this has now been to ensure that that's going to happen seamlessly and hence why a 12 month transition has been incorporated into the code from an energy efficiency provisions from the national provisions. So they don't apply from 1 May of this year, they will apply from 1 May 2022. So 1 May 2020, sorry, I was working on wrong years already. So the ABCB are currently revising their energy efficiency handbook and a lot in that handbook, there's gonna be a lot of new worked examples, a lot more detail in there, talk, you know, covering off on a lot of the stuff I've mentioned today. So it's not been published or well, may have just been recently published, or it's just about to be published, but there's some good, some good information in there. And if you're working in this space, these building ceiling provisions I talked about, this, um, the blower door test method, if you're interested, there's more information in there. Okay, I'll talk on this one and then I'll open it up for some questions after this. 
So there's also been some changes to the evidence of suitability provisions in the code. And these provisions are your documentary requirements for your building products, designs, forms of construction. These provisions have been in the code since the very first edition and probably hadn't been reviewed in a detailed way since they were first incorporated into the code. The requirements state that every part of a building must be constructed in an appropriate manner to achieve the requirements of the BCA using materials that are fit for the purpose for which they are intended. So a governing clause in the code. Under that, there's options under A5.2, um, which lists your evidence of suitability options you can use to demonstrate compliance. And those options include a code mark certificate of conformance, a certificate of accreditation issued by a state accreditation system, which I only think Victoria have one at the moment, a report from a, um, from a, a report or a certificate from a, a NADA requested testing laboratory, um, a report from a professional engineer, a, and, there's, and then there's also another form of documentary evidence, which might include things such as a product technical statement. So there's a number of different options you can use under this, or you can use a combination of these options as part of demonstrating that your material, product, form of construction or design um, is fit for purpose and meets the relevant requirements of the code. So the changes to the provisions have really looked at some of the documentation requirements and you know, things like this product meets bushfire requirements. Well, which ones? What's BR level? You know, is there any limitations or scope of use or conditions on the use of that building product or system? You know, putting some of this sort of stuff into it, so hopefully that the documentation that comes out, that the building certifier can be satisfied that the information put in front of them um, demonstrates that the material formal construction design complies with the code, and then yourselves as builders, building designers and others can you know, look at the documentary evidence and know what parts of the code it satisfies rather than just say it meets the X standard, but then also looking at is there conditions or scope of use or limitations. One thing I'd, you know, I'll make as an example is a window. A window might say it meets AS2047. That's great, but from there, if that window is used in a second story and it's used in a bedroom, now it needs to have restrictions and openable requirements. If that's used in a bushfire prone area, different requirements apply. If that's used within 500 mil of the floor, different safety glass requirements apply. If that's used in a, in a, in a snow zone, there's other loading requirements that apply. So just saying meets AS2047 doesn't tell you the full story. And that's where we want to get that product documentation, the evidentiary requirements, you know, being much more clearer about its application. You know, and, and uh, Tim mentioned before about some of the certificates, you know, it might be a code mark certificate or a test report, where it might say, you know, meets fire requirements, you know. Or a lot of these systems, particularly the external wall systems, need to meet structural, fire, weatherproofing, you know, energy efficiency potentially. All of this stuff, you know, where it might only verify compliance with one or two parts or tested for one or two parts. So there's documentation requirements to try and be clearer about all of this stuff. Um, there's also the strengthening of the other form of documentary evidence option, um, which, as Tim mentioned, had some criticisms around it about a note from Mum. What this one is, it's trying to strengthen it to say that another form of documentary evidence linking to how it meets the... and prescribing in the evidence how it meets the requirements of the code and, you know, and what relevant clauses and what test it's been subject to. This one here has also comes under criticism quite a bit, but a lot of the other dot forms of documentary evidence you probably don't even realise you're using all the time. So installation manuals that you get with products generally would form another form of documentary evidence. You know, where you might be doing a stair design doesn't tell you what your structural requirements of your stair are. It might just say the stair needs to meet these riser and goings, but doesn't tell you your structural requirements. That documentary evidence might be underpinned under that. You know, a lot of these supporting materials that go with a lot of the product documentation is that, you know, even certificates you might get for your waterproofing of your bathroom or your termite management systems, that could be considered another form of documentary evidence. So that's trying to bring more clarity to that and that's um, been a really important change. Also about trying to bring, bring forward a bit of a more rigour about the evidence options in the code rather than just having all of those options. You know, having a, a rigour test to say, is this form of evidence good enough 
for what this design material form of construction is in front of me. Another one has been that there's been a lot more supporting material adopted as part of this and also about the inclusion of product technical statements as a form of evidence and I'll go into a bit more detail about what that means. So a new evidence of suitability handbook has been produced and that's a really you know, fundamental document to improve the understanding of the evidence of suitability provisions. A lot of people only thought they applied to performance solutions. They apply to both performance and deemed to satisfy. Understanding the different evidence options and a lot of the stuff I've mentioned today about that and giving some clarity around them. As part of that evidence of suitability handbook, a, some, a form of a hierarchy of the evidence of suitability options has been incorporated into the code, um, you know, in terms of a bit of a, a decision tree type of thing, um, in terms of your evidence options. Another thing that's been incorporated in there, it's not mandatory to use it, but it forms part of that maybe consideration on that rigour test, is a risk assessment matrix, which looks at the likelihood of a product failing and the consequence if it did, and then looking at using higher forms of evidence suitability where it's in that higher category. This is something, this document has come from New Zealand in the past where they had a product assurance handbook, and HA and a number of others in particular were trying to, were really advocated that the, that the ABCB should be look at developing a handbook such as this to improve that product documentation and product evidentiary requirements that non-conforming building product issue and things like that to try and lift the level of documentation and evidence requirements. Another one that's been incorporated into there is a thing called product technical statements and it gives a template within the handbook. It's also now referenced as one of the options under the evidence of suitability provisions. I think we'll start to see a lot more of these product technical statements being developed and this gives really clear stuff in terms of description of the product, scope and limitation of use. Which standards or parts to the code does it, does it comply with? You know, any conditions on its use? All of that stuff to try and improve the documentation requirements and make it really clear. You know, if you can have this sort of stuff, it's on a single page, it might be underpinned by test reports and other things, but we think it's a really good initiative going forward. And I think we'll probably see more and more of these being developed and I know Hardy's are looking at them at the moment and a number of other manufacturers are looking at producing these and I think it's a really good initiative.